Thursday, November the 5th. And as I've been writing about at uh, Bearing Arms, this is an important election, not only for gun owners in Virginia, where this is absolutely critical, uh, but this is an important election for gun owners all across the country because gun control advocates are viewing Virginia as not only uh, a, a great opportunity to make inroads, but to put together a game plan that they can then take to other states around the nation in the 2020 elections. And if they are able to flip the Virginia House of Delegates, the Virginia State Senate, to turn those two chambers into anti-gun legislative bodies, well, they're going to build a narrative around that, that Americans want this quote-unquote common-sense gun safety regulation. Why, look just what happened in Virginia and they're going to try to take that case perhaps to your state. I sat down with Jim Garrity from National Review to talk about the upcoming elections in Virginia and why they are so critically important for Second Amendment advocates all across the nation. Take a look and a listen. Jim Garrity, is great talking with you again, sir. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Cam. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. We are uh, a week away from Election Day. Well, a week and a day away from Election Day uh, in New Jersey and Virginia. Uh, we haven't actually talked a lot about New Jersey here on the program, uh, in large part because uh, I, I fear that New Jersey is going to remain as anti-gun as it has been. Uh, Virginia, on the other hand, it's been 20 years since we've seen a gun control bill become law in the state of Virginia. And uh, Democrats are running hard on gun control in uh, in the state of Virginia this year. They are. Uh, you know, listeners with uh, good memories may recall that in 2017, uh, the first kind of big statewide elections after um, President Trump had been elected, Virginia Democrats were fired up. They were convinced they were going to have a good year. Virginia Republicans were like, no, no, we're probably going to be fine. We have nice big majorities in the state house and the state senate, and they almost lost their majority. They came really close. They have one seat majority. Some people may remember the uh, the footage of that race, I believe, down in Virginia Beach, where uh, they had to settle. It came out to an exact tie. They had to settle it by picking a name out of a hat. Yep. That preserved the Republican majority in the state house, which I this is not the way you want to win. <laughs> you know, generally you want to have nice big majorities. Uh, so they kept majorities, but obviously it's, you know you've got a one seat majority, which means you've, you know, don't have you don't have much wiggle room, so to speak. Um, after a shooting in Virginia Beach uh, earlier this year, Virginia Governor Ralph Northam said he wanted to have a special session to pass gun control bills. He wanted to uh, have universal background checks, and I believe it was also a one gun a month policy. And you know, by golly, we've got to do something. Um, the special session lasted about an hour. The state senate and Virginia the Republican majorities in the state senate. And today's House said, look, they haven't even completed the investigation of this shooting. This is a political stunt. This is blatantly an effort to try to pressure us before the election. We are adjourning until after the election. And the Republican Virginia Democrats said, fine, we're going to run on this. And so far, they are running on this. Um, every town and, and all the other gun control groups are dumping money into this. And uh, I think, you know, if you're a Republican, you, you, is there a potential you could have a good year and keep your majorities? Sure. I don't think you'd want to count on it based on what we're seeing right now. But uh, this is probably going to be a hard fought race all the way down to the wire. Absolutely. Uh, and, and there are, you know, first of all, I mean, as you mentioned, gun control groups are uh, spending heavily to the tune of millions of dollars. And they're not, they're not doing this in uh, every race. They're focusing on about 14 different races in both the House and the Senate. As you said, there's really just, you know, slim majorities in both of those chambers. Uh, and, and there are some, and there have been, I think, some unforced errors on the part of Republicans. Uh, Delegate Nick Freitas uh, won his reelection in 2017, I think with 66% of the vote. Uh, he is a write-in candidate this year because of uh, apparently his campaign manager did not manage to uh, uh, get the campaign paperwork filed on time and correctly. And so he's not actually on the ballot Jim, you know, and, and again, when you're looking at every one of these races and every one of these districts being so critically important, you know, things like that uh, could absolutely, I mean, imagine, you know, 2017 winning control of the House of Delegates due to a coin flip. Imagine losing it uh, because a, a, you know, a, an incumbent in a safe district mm -hmm. didn't get their paperwork filed correctly. Yeah, I, the last thing I want to do is kick around Virginia Republicans, uh, in part because they talk to me, and I try to see But But there's a, there's a, bit, a bunch of frustrating developments this cycle. Uh, not just, you know, people, obviously, you know, listeners are probably saying, you know, how, how can you put, be possibly be in a rough shape 
this is a state that has Ralph Northam, Governor Blackface, uh, or, or correct, or maybe he was the Klansman, one of the other. We're not sure which photo. one, right, yeah. Yeah, Governor Coonman, which was, he said it was his nickname in his, in his uh, yearbook there, uh, and Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax, who had a sexual assault allegations, plus you had Mark Herring, the Attorney General, who also had blackface in his younger days. Um, people will be looking at this thing, my God, how could Virginia Republicans not be having, be set to have a great year? Look, Virginia state legislature's races do not usually get a ton of attention and generate a ton of excitement. Um, a lot of people barely know who their state legislator is. And so, and also it's worth noting that the Virginia state legislature is a part-time job. Um, generally, this is not something that, you know, some, you have to really want to do it. I, I decided to run up the numbers, uh, Cam, just out of curiosity, because I look, I live up, you know, what I call up in city woods here in Fairfax County. Chap Peterson is our state senator, and when I got my sample ballot, I was, you know, a little disappointed to find no one was running against him. What's more, Greg, is no one's running against my state house representative either. Um, so I ran through the numbers. There are seven house districts with a Republican on the ballot, but no Democrat. So if you're a Republican, you're feeling really good about that. In most of these races, you have a Libertarian candidate or somebody else running third party or write-in or something. But obviously, if you're one of the two major party candidates, you've probably got a big advantage. There are 27 House districts with a Democrat running, but no Republican running. Wow. So in more than a quarter, you know, the Democrats already have this race won. And one of them, I was kind of, you know, it's really kind of both bothersome. Um, this is uh, uh, the 57th district, uh, which is right around Charlottesville, a uh, little bit of the, out of the county next to it. Basically, it's, it's you know, it, it's University of Virginia. Mm-hmm. So, so you're going to have a lot of college kids. You're going to have a lot of Democrats, university professors. Okay, it's going to be a tough spot for a Republican to win. That having been said, it's a retiree. The, the incumbent is retiring. The Democrat who won the primary is now pretty much already assured of that district. Not even put you, If you don't have anybody on the ballot, you can't go out and win them. And the situation in the Senate is pretty similarly bad. There are four Senate districts with a Republican running but no Democrat. There are 15 Senate districts with a Democrat running but no Republican. Uh, interestingly enough, one of those districts was uh, District Number 25, where the state senator is pre who was running for governor a couple of cycles ago. That's right. And, and, you know, I mean, going back two years to 2017, one of the things that Democrats were very focused on, they said, we want to run in every district. And it doesn't matter if it's a safe Republican district. We want to have a Democrat on the ballot. That's one of the reasons why they were able to make the gains that they were able to make in 2017. You can't score an upset. If you're not competing, uh, and I got to tell you, I mean that that's really disappointing to hear. You know, 15 Senate seats, but again, almost a quarter, actually almost half of what Democrats need to take control of the House of Delegates, they they, mm-hmm. they can bank on that uh, before a vote is even cast, because in 25 of those districts, as you say, there's not even a Republican on the ballot. Yep, don't have to spend any resources, don't have to run ad time. No, look, obviously you're not you're you're going to have your toughest time referring candidates when the opposing party has a big advantage. Sure. So granted, that is, you know, there's a reason you have a tough time finding candidates to run in the new district. That having been said, you know, if you let's, you know, like there's, you can say the political environment right now is not great for Republicans. Um, but if there was a wave, you'd want to have as many candidates on the ballot as possible to be in a position to enjoy that wave. And separately, Cam, look, you know, in a year that began with these, you know, three egregious scandals engulfing the, uh, the top three statewide officials in this state, you never know who's going to get caught in bed with a goat, Cam. You know, like you, just, <laughs> you never know when somebody is going to have some sudden giant revelation that completely changes voters' opinion of them, and you want to have somebody on the ballot. I mean, at the congressional level, Republicans won um, a wiener seat. Now that's a, that's a, I think it scores out like a Democrats plus 27 in the Cook partisan vote. This is a heavily Democratic district, but lo and behold, after Anthony Weiner had his really egregious scandal, the voters in the district are like, you know what? I'm voting for the Republican. Just for this cycle, I can't vote for this guy. So, uh, it was too late for them to do a tourist belly maneuver, and that's, that's where the situation was. So, so why, do you, why do you think it is that, uh, that Ralph Northam, uh, you know, d- d- Democrats continue to embrace him? Uh, and, and Justin Fairfax and Mark Herring, it's almost like the party decided, well, this isn't going to be a scandal. Uh, and they refused mm-hmm. to let it become one, and eventually the uh, the media lost interest. I mean, you know, the last we heard from Ralph Herring, or from uh, Ralph Herring, from Ralph Northam, <laughs> <laughs> they're all in the, they're almost all those black all those blackface politicians look alike to me. Uh, <laughs> yes, last we heard from Ralph Northam, uh, he was going to get to the bottom of this. He was going to figure out who was in that picture 
right? Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the, the medical school that uh, the yearbook was a part of, they did their own investigation and said, hey, we can't really figure out who this was. And, and then this, this story just kind of quietly faded away, Jim. It's the immaculate yearbook photo. It, it just happened. It just spontaneously <laughs> appeared. No one could explain it. It's um, a miracle. Yeah, so like, you know, we can... Now, here's the thing. It, it is worth noting that this was a big deal in the local media and in you know, institutions like the Washington Post. Uh, and I mean, they didn't call him an austere scholar uh, or, or anything <laughs> yeah, like right. that. Like, their comparisons were back daddy. But, you know, like, for people who complain, ah, the media, you know, never wanted to cover this. No, the media was, was interested in covering this in January and February. <laughs> and as it got to March... You know, uh, I think it was Jonathan Martin of the, the New York Times. The New York Times was like, isn't it strange the way this, this scandals engulf the state? And then they simply slowly faded away. Gee, amazing how that happened, whereas there wasn't this steady drumbeat. And there were, there were two things. Um, there, were, there were a couple of things that would matter here. The first is that Ralph Northam is not capable, is not eligible to run for another term. Right. If there was a prospect of Democrats having to go into uh, 2021, uh, that, that, that year sounds like science fiction, and that's just a few years away. Um, if you have election day 2021, Northam was going to have to run for re-election. Then you'd see Democrats freaking out and saying, we've got to get rid of this guy. We can't have this guy at the top of the ticket, et cetera, et cetera. Um, very much like a, I, I would use the term Mexican standoff, but I suggest it probably would, probably would offend somebody who's very sensitive these days, Cam. But let's just say a uh, mutually assured destruction pact existed between Northam and Fairfax and Herring, because there was no way to get any one, of, any one of them to go away without people explaining, well, wait a second, why did you get rid of this guy, but you're allowing that guy to stay into office? Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the, the ordinarily, the people who, you know, this is where the situation where ordinarily, in ordinary circumstances, Justin Fairfax would say, you know, Ralph Northam and I have worked together for a long time, and I respect him a great deal. I know he's a changed man, but this issue has just become too much of a quick distraction and it's time for the state to move on. You know, the situation where he could gently nudge the guy out of office. And then of course he would assume the offices of the governorship that couldn't happen in this situation because Fairfax had his own allegations to deal with. And the guy, okay, well maybe the chief law enforcement officer in the state could do it. No, no, Herring's got his own too. Um, so you put all of that together, coupled with the fact that again, democratic interest groups could see the score on this and recognize, well, if we get rid of one of these guys, people are going to add, because the pressure would come to get rid of the other two guys. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden the, the house, uh, sorry, state assembly speaker, Kirk Cox, a Republican would take control. And well, we can't have that. That's the truly worst scenario. Cam, that's, that's a disaster. The state could never, you know, uh, could never survive. Yeah. And my suspicion is that's why all the people who ordinarily would get really upset by a, a politician wearing black, uh, wearing black face. Obviously, African-Americans would be very offended. I, I think basically Americans of any stripe would be offended. I think even, you know, good progressives like Justin Trudeau would be offended by uh, <laughs> someone wearing blackface. Eh, and, uh, eh, come see, come saw. <laughs> and, 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 of course, you know, all of it, it was in everybody's political self-interest to register their strong disapproval and then do nothing. And this mm-hmm. is, you know, this gave me flashback to the Bill Clinton stuff, Cam, because in 1998, when at the height of the Lewinsky scandal, a very popular thing for you know, Democrats to do was to say, this is appalling the president who's used terrible judgments. I call on him to resign. And Bill Clinton would say, no, no, I'm not going to do that. And the Democrat would then say, okay, then let's move on. <laughs> you yeah, know, right. it's like the sheer process of rejecting the demand. Well, okay, there's nothing else we can do. I'm not that angry about it. Yeah. So, you know, I uh, said uh, probably a week or so ago that, uh, this election in Virginia should be a canary in the coal mine for gun owners around the country because uh, if um, they are able to flip the House and the Senate and, and Virginia does become a uh, an anti-gun state uh, from, you know, the, the governor on down, gun control groups are going to try to replicate that uh, all around the country in 2020. And while obviously, you know, we're paying very close attention to the presidential race, you know, Republicans and, and, and frankly, pro-Second Amendment politicians enjoy a majority uh, in a majority of state legislatures and mm-hmm. uh, gun control advocates, they're not going to put all of their eggs in that 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 federal basket. Well, let's flip the Senate. We already control the House. Let's uh, take back the White House. You know, they would love to do that. And they'll be spending hundreds of millions of dollars to try to do that. But uh, they also know how important it is to put in place at the state level uh, anti-gun regimes as well. H- how important uh, do you think this race is for 2020? Uh, and, and how much attention, you know, again, it, it's, it's tough to get Virginians to pay attention to these uh, races, but uh, how much attention do you think people outside of the state of Virginia should be paying to this race? 
they, they should be paying very close attention because if this playbook works here, they're going to try to replicate it in every state everywhere. Um, and maybe it would not succeed in the Wyoming of the world. But by and large, there are a whole bunch of states in that upper Midwest, and even in the South, Georgia, North Carolina, um, in the West, upper Midwest. I mean, there, there's all kinds of places where this playbook could conceivably work again. And in addition to all these races where there, you know, Republicans are not running, as we talked about earlier, look, these are often a whole bunch of the same places where they lost U.S. House seats. Uh, the suburbs used to be areas the Republican Party could run reasonably well. And when you talk about focusing on the, the state legislative races, Cam, one of the things that made me feel good about being a man of the right, and particularly, particularly during the Obama era, is you could look to the National Rifle Association, you could look to groups like Alex, the various Coke uh, seminar network groups and groups like that, and you could do it. They paid attention to the little stuff. They paid attention to the state legislative races that weren't uh, sexy and romantic and exciting and the sort of thing people paid a lot of attention to. You don't see state legislators slow jamming the news with Jimmy Fallon. Uh, you know, with Obama, you know, excited a bunch of Democrats, and he got him to show up in presidential years. Conservatives, particularly during the Tea Party era, were doing a great job of showing up in these special elections and in these, you know, lower races. And, you know, lo and behold, as, as the gun, uh, uh, Second Amendment, you know, various movements have recognized, this stuff matters. That what kind of laws get passed, what kind of regulations get enacted, what kind of personnel gets appointed. All this stuff matters, and if you stop paying attention to that, you start losing these battles, and the consequences can be pretty darn big. Absolutely. Jim Garrity with National Review. Thank you, as always, sir, for joining us on the program today. It's great talking with you again. Always enjoy it, Kim. I'm hoping we have good news to talk about in a week and a, in a day, but, uh, you know, keep your fingers crossed, and if you're if you're in Virginia, pay attention, and if you're in my situation, I guess you just got to write somebody out. <laughs> Jim Garrity joining us here on Barry and Arms, Cam and Company. All right, let's get to uh, another story here before we get to our uh, Hero of the Day, our uh, Deed of the Day, and our uh, recidivism report. Uh, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, I'm still puzzled over this.